actually the, the Institute and our department in particular has a long history of involvement in marine mammal work. The U.S. Navy has studied, trained, and utilized uh, dolphins, some other small cetaceans, and California sea lions for about 30 years. And we have provided support, uh, pathology support, during that period. Dr. George Magaki, who uh, retired from the AFIP uh, just a few years ago, had a strong personal interest Now I'm wired. Dr. Magaki had a strong personal interest in diseases of marine mammals and brought many cases to the Institute uh, into the, the archive there. In recent years, at the request of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we became involved in studying the effects of the Exxon Valdez oil spill on sea otters in Prince William Sound. And we've also worked with the National Marine Fisheries Service studying uh, both environmental impacts and just causes of mortality, uh, primarily in small cetaceans, mainly dolphins. So over the years, through these primary sources and also just submission of individual cases, a large archive of pathologic material on marine mammals has uh, accumulated. Uh, it is probably the largest such archive in the world. There are well over 2,000 cases currently. Uh, very recently, Dr. Linda Johnson and her staff in the uh, Division of uh, Comparative Pathology at the AFIP have made this, the information from uh, these cases much more accessible by producing a uh, marine mammal database. So uh, today I'll be presenting some information on infectious diseases of marine mammals. Uh, before I get started, I, I'd like to acknowledge several people who contributed material that I'll be showing you today. They include Drs. Magaki, Moeller, Medway, Domingo, Kennedy, Wilson, Barr, Britt, and probably some others. When, uh, when we talk about marine mammals, we're uh, referring to uh, four or five different groups of animals. These include cetaceans, uh, which are subdivided into the odontocetes, or toothed whales, such as these Atlantic bottlenose dolphins, and the mysticetes, or baleen whales, such as this humpback whale, and of course the, uh, the mysticetes uh, feed by filtering. Uh, let's see if I can figure this out. <laughs> Here we go. By filtering seawater through their baleen. Depress this thing like you really mean it. The uh, second large group of uh, marine mammals is the pinnipeds. Uh, pinnipeds are divided into three groups. There are the uh, odorids, such as this California sea lion. Uh, they have these external ear flaps, and they're able to uh, uh, rise up uh, the, the front, or they can uh, elevate the front part of their body with their flippers so they can ambulate fairly well on land. Uh, fur seals are also odorids. Then also within the pinniped group are the uh, phocids or true seals, such as these harbor seals. Uh, they don't have the external ear flaps, and they're unable to raise up the front part of their body with their front flippers. And then the third pinniped group is the, uh, the walrus. There's one mustelid, the sea otter. 
and there are the Cyrenians, uh, dugongs, and, and manatees such as these. Uh, supposedly, the legends about uh, mermaids uh, came into being because seamen, after being at sea for many, many <laughs> months, I guess they had vivid imaginations. What can I say? Okay, we'll start off with uh, viral diseases, uh, which have been really the most uh, exciting and dynamic area of uh, research in diseases of marine mammals. And uh, the interest in viral diseases is basically because of uh, morbillivirus. virus. Uh, just a little basic information on uh, morbilliviruses in general. Uh, morbilliviruses are single-stranded RNA viruses. They cause serious disease in a number of species of animals. Measles in humans is a, a very important pathogen. It uh, continues to cause uh, case fatality rates approaching 20 percent in third world countries. And of course, it also uh, frequently causes fatal disease in non-human primates. Canine distemper virus, very important disease of dogs and uh, a number of other carnivores, including apparently Serengeti lions. It's been reported recently. Um, render pest virus and uh, pest uh, de petit ruminant cause uh, periodic uh, epizootics in uh, uh, cattle and uh, small ruminants, respectively, and in related species. But uh, within the last few years, several new morbilliviruses have emerged as important causes of uh, uh, epizootic disease in several species of marine mammals on three different continents. In 1987, a morbillivirus uh, very closely related or identical to canine distemper virus killed thousands of Baikal seals in Lake Baikal in the Soviet Union former Soviet Union. Um, a different morbillivirus killed thousands of harbor seals in northwestern Europe in 1988. <coughs> Still another morbillivirus killed thousands of striped dolphins in the Mediterranean Sea in 1990 and 1991. Fatal morbillivirus infection has also been reported in harbor porpoises and a single common, uh, common dolphin. Very recently, my colleagues and I have documented morbilliviral disease in bottlenose dolphins of the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts of the United States. Start with uh, harbor seal morbillivirus. Affected harbor seals were dyspneic, and they had serous to mucopurulent oculonasal discharge, similar to that seen in canine distemper. Lungs from these animals had patchy or, as in this case, uh, cranioventral areas of consolidation. This dark red area through here. They frequently also had uh, both interstitial and mediastinal emphysema, very prominent mediastinal emphysema in this case. The emphysema frequently extended into the subcutaneous tissues of the neck. Histologically, there was bronchointerstitial pneumonia with type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia and syncytial cells. Suppurative bronchopneumonia, as, you, as seen here, was uh, frequently present and probably represents secondary bacterial infection. There also were uh, syncytial cells and occasional uh, both intracytoplasmic and intranuclear inclusion bodies. Uh, some of you may be able to see a couple of intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies in the bronchial or epithelium there. And here's a syncytial cell. This is an immunoperoxidase stain demonstrating morbillivirus antigen 
within bronchiolar epithelium. The only clinical sign observed in uh, affected striped dolphins was disorientation, which was manifested by the dolphins colliding with boats. Uh, generally, they were just found moribund or dead on beaches. This, these are normal striped dolphins, uh, Stenella cerulio alba. And there's their stripe that gives them their name. And again, the, the primary gross lesion was pneumonia. And as in the, uh, the other example, in this case, it's a craniovental pneumonia. The closer view, you can see that the uh, pleural lymphatics are dilated, indicating uh, rather marked edema as well. Histologically, there's a necrotizing bronchointerstitial pneumonia. Uh, the pulmonary capillaries are congested, and in this area, the alveoli are filled with necrotic debris. Can you focus that a little, Jeff? Thanks. At higher magnification here, you can see uh, type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia. And uh, in addition to just necrotic debris, you can start to pick up some of the syncytial, cell, syncytial cells here and there. Uh, see them a little bit better here. <laughs> this uh, thin section with very high magnification uh, nicely demonstrates both syncytial cells and uh, intranuclear inclusion bodies. And that's out of focus, isn't it? It's hard for me to judge from here. Could you sharpen that a little, Jeff? Thanks. That looks good. Uh, this is a, an immunoperoxidase. I should mention that all of these immunoperoxidase sections were, the, the staining was performed by Dr. Seamus Kennedy at the uh, Department of Agriculture for Northern Ireland. And uh, we won't worry with focus anymore. <laughs> but you can see there's abundant viral antigen within, uh, there's a syncytial cell that contains it within type 2 pneumocytes, uh, also probably in some macrophages. And that's just another example, some nice syncytial cells there. Non-separative encephalitis was a frequent finding in the striped dolphins and uh, was undoubtedly the cause of the uh, disorientation seen clinically. And occasionally, syncytial cells are present, and you can see a couple of intranuclear inclusion bodies there. Here's a cell with both an intranuclear and an intracytoplasmic inclusion body. As in other morbilliviral diseases, uh, lymphoid depletion is a prominent finding. This is spleen from a striped dolphin. And all of these uh, pale areas, the spleen is congested. All of these pale areas uh, should be white pulp, but you can see they're just small numbers of dark blue lymphocytes remaining. Higher magnification is showing this dramatic lymphoid depletion. OK. Uh, Small numbers of harbor porpoises that were found beached on the coast of Northern Ireland and England at the time of the harbor seal epizootic were found to have morbillivirus infection. Lesions were generally similar to those seen in the harbor seals and striped dolphins. Uh, here's a kind of a grainy underwater view of a harbor porpoise. And uh, this is brain from an affected harbor porpoise with many degenerating neurons, uh, some that contain rather ill-defined 
cytoplasmic inclusion bodies. A single common dolphin that was found stranded on the coast of England had lesions in lung and lymph node, uh, including syncytial cells and intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies that were considered diagnostic of morbillivirus infection, but uh, no confirmatory testing, uh, such as use of the immunoperoxidase, was reported. And that, that's a common dolphin, Delphinus delphus. Okay, now we'll move on to very recent information. Um, last year, in June of last year, a adult, an adult female bottlenose dolphin stranded near Panama City, Florida, and a necropsy was performed by uh, a member of the Marine Mammal Stranding Network in that area. The, the Marine Mammal Stranding Network is a volunteer organization that works closely with the National Marine Fisheries Service, federal organization, to assist and study stranded marine mammals. So uh, a Dr. Byron Ford, a veterinarian, did this uh, necropsy and sent the tissues to me. This is trachea from this dolphin, and the mucosa has undergone coagulative necrosis. Uh, there's a deep zone of uh, rather intense inflammation and some branching structures here at the uh, interface between the two areas. And the, these structures are fungal hyphae. They're about three to six microns in width. They are septate. They show dichotomous branching at acute angles. So they're morphologically consistent with. All right, aspergillus. This is lung from this dolphin with a nice radial array of uh, similar hyphae. Uh, the fungal hyphae were also present within the myocardium in areas of necrosis. So the, the cause of death was clearly disseminated aspergillosis. However, in areas of lung that were uh, relatively unaffected by the fungal pneumonia, there are occasional multinucleated cells such as this one. And at very high magnification, you can see that there are intranuclear inclusion bodies in several of those nuclei. There also are some very characteristic morphologic features of this cell. The uh, central eosinophilia ring of nuclei, then a peripheral clear zone in the cytoplasm, and the cell membrane is out here. Uh, these findings are very characteristic of uh, morbilliviral syncytia in dolphins. So uh, having seen this cell, I uh, uh, got very excited. And uh, this was the first uh, case of uh, morbilliviral infection in a marine mammal from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I did confirm it after I stopped hyperventilating. I sent sections to Dr. Kennedy. And here's another pulmonary syncytial cell uh, here. And the, the brown staining, again, indicates morbilliviral antigen. Cytoplasm is loaded. And you can see here a focal area of intranuclear staining, which would correspond to a, an inclusion body by uh, normal H&E uh, histology. And this is oral mucosa from the same dolphin, just indicating more uh, morbilliviral antigen. So after uh, finding this case, I, I called the National Marine Fisheries Service and asked if they were seeing increased stranding of bottlenose dolphins in Florida or anywhere else in the Gulf. And uh, to my surprise, they said no. Uh, so. At that point, we didn't really know what was going on. Uh, morbilliviral infection might have been uh, enzootic in dolphins of the Gulf of Mexico, and this was just a sporadic case. Or we could have been in the early stages of an epizootic, 
and it just hadn't been recognized yet. I uh, didn't know, but uh, over the next few months, the situation was clarified. Uh, this is lymph node from a bottlenose dolphin that's stranded on a, a barrier island off the Mississippi coast um, last November, and it's mildly depleted, contains a syncytial cell there. Lung from this dolphin, again, aspergillus. Um, all told, over the next several months, we uh, confirmed morbillivirus infection in seven bottlenose dolphins from the Gulf of Mexico based on histologic and immunocytochemical findings. And uh, it was interesting that uh, in five of those seven cases, there was uh, concurrent aspergillosis, uh, suggesting immunosuppression for one thing and uh, why aspergillus as opposed to other opportunistic pathogens, I don't know. But uh, a few more lesions from, from this particular dolphin uh, was in very good condition and had uh, very well-developed lesions, much more clear-cut than uh, many of the cases. But uh, there are a couple of intranuclear inclusion bodies in uh, bronchiolar epithelium here. Here is a trophy-sized uh, pulmonary syncytial cell, uh, one of my personal favorites. And another pulmonary syncytial cell, again, with that characteristic morphology, central eosinophilia and so on. Uh, one more. This was uh, a dolphin that stranded on the Alabama coast. This is urinary bladder, and you can see that the uh, transitional epithelium is just loaded with uh, intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies similar to uh, what might be seen in canine distemper. So here's a little bit of stranding data from Alabama. Uh, these numbers indicate the number of dolphins that stranded in each of these months in 1993 and in January of 94. Here's the historical mean for those periods, standard deviation, mean plus two standard deviations. Suffice it to say that the uh, stranding rate was elevated in Alabama pretty much throughout the summer and fall of 93. And our, we had five confirmed cases from Alabama, uh, three in October and one each in November and December. Similar data from Mississippi, and the stranding rate was elevated from August through December. We had only have one confirmed case from November. So basically, we, we had, uh, I think, convincing demonstration of uh, morbillivirus infection in those animals based on histology and immunoperoxidase findings. Uh, they were found uh, at times of increased mortality. Uh, we know that morbilliviruses and related species have caused epizootics, so we believe that uh, morbillivirus was likely the cause of that increased mortality. Just to give you a little bit of a, a geographic perspective on this, uh, our first case was in Panama City in June. Then we had uh, three cases around uh, Mobile Bay, Alabama, in and around Mobile Bay, Alabama in October. We had one case on a barrier island off the Mississippi coast in November, and then another case in the Mobile Bay area in December. So it's a small number of cases, but there's at least a suggestion that the virus was moving in a westerly direction. Uh, Louisiana is kind of a black hole as far as uh, the marine mammal stranding network. I grew up in New Orleans. I didn't mean that in an ugly way. Or, <laughs> but uh, it's mainly, it's not because of lack of interest, I, I don't think. It's just the coastline is not very amenable to finding stranded animals, the, all the marshes and bayous and so forth. But uh, 
Texas, on the other hand, has a, a good uh, stranding network and uh, a coastline that's uh, more suitable. So we were very interested in, in what might happen in Texas. And uh, you can see that uh, 93 was a pretty routine year, nothing much going on. There was one little uptick in mortality in August. But then in December, there was a fairly substantial increase in mortality over the historical mean. And it continued into January. And then uh, through the first five months of, uh, of 94, it uh, continued. And at rather significant numbers. Unfortunately, all of the carcasses that were washing ashore in Texas were in very advanced stages of uh, post-mortem decomposition, making uh, histology and immunohistochemistry virtually useless. But fortunately, um, the, uh, well, starting shortly after our first case from Florida uh, in the summer of 93, people in the uh, cellular pathology department at the AFIP, specifically in the molecular diagnostics laboratory, began working on developing a polymerase chain reaction test for the dolphin morbillivirus. virus. And uh, all of you probably know all about PCR, but just uh, very briefly, it's certainly a, uh, one of the most powerful techniques in molecular biology. Um, Morbilli viruses are RNA viruses. Uh, PCR is a DNA-based technology, so the first thing you have to do is uh, uh, convert the viral RNA to DNA with uh, reverse transcriptase. Um, a target is selected. In this case, uh, uh, the people involved, who, who are doctors uh, Taubenberger, Leachy, Kraft, and Klonberg, uh, selected part of the uh, viral phosphoprotein gene, uh, a relatively short segment, 78 base pairs, but it's uh, specific for morbilli viruses. And uh, I guess it's, uh, you know, I, I don't know anything about this stuff, <laughs> so you'll have to forgive me. But uh, apparently, working with RNA is quite difficult. And uh, they, they plugged away at it for some time. But in, in fact, I had kind of given up on them. I, I used to, initially, I'd call them every month or so, but then I gave up. You know, they, they just kind of put me off and say, no, nah, we don't have any. It's hard. So I thought they had probably lost interest and quit, but uh, just about the time uh, all this was happening in Texas and the numbers were way up, it was uh, in the spring, uh, Jeff Taubenberger called me up and said they had it working. And uh, we confirmed that it was in fact working uh, using the cases that, in which we had uh, good histology and positive immunohistochemistry. Uh, so we knew we had a good test. This is just a diagram of how PCR works. The uh, first step is uh, DNA denaturation. The, the sample's heated, causes the DNA strands to separate. Then specific primers are applied that attach on either side of the target sequence. Uh, it's called primer annealing. Then uh, DNA polymerase is added, uh, and the nucleotides are incorporated, creating new strands. This is a primer extension. So you end up uh, doubling the number of strands that you start with. Uh, after 20 cycles, you have a million-fold amplification. After 30 cycles, you have a billion-fold amplification. So then you can uh, detect, or certain people can detect the uh, PCR product on uh, agarose gel, in this case, forming a band of appropriate size and so forth. And then uh, the 
in positive cases, uh, the uh, identification was confirmed using a southern blot. And beyond that, uh, the specific strain can be identified using strain-specific probes on the PCR product. So in brief, uh, in spite of the severe post-mortem decomposition of these specimens, they were lung sections uh, that were sent in from Texas, they uh, were able to identify morbillivirus RNA in, uh, I believe it was uh, 25, no, it was 18 of 25 cases in which there was amplifiable RNA. In some cases, there was no uh, non-degraded RNA. But 18 of 25 is 72 percent, I believe. So it's really quite remarkable. So putting the whole thing together, the confirmed cases uh, with good histology, immunoperoxidase, PCR, uh, we think we've got a, a good case that uh, morbil a mil a, excuse me, a morbillivirus epizootic was the cause of the increased mortality. Many of you may remember back in 1987 and 1988, there was a dramatic increase in mortality of bottlenose dolphins along the east coast of the United States. Uh, the, this was a much more dramatic event than what I just described in the Gulf. It was a, a tenfold increase in mortality. Uh, it was estimated that uh, half of the inshore bottlenose dolphin population from New Jersey to Florida died. Uh, an investigation was conducted and uh, a conclusion was reached that brevitoxin produced by a red tide, in other words a, an algal toxin, was uh, likely responsible for this mortality event. And this conclusion was based on detection of brevitoxin in livers of 8 of 17 dolphins. This conclusion was highly controversial. In fact, it was so controversial that congressional subcommittee hearings were held on the investigation. And at these hearings, uh, a number of scientists voiced their uh, reservations with uh, the conclusions of the initial investigation. Uh, this kind of a synopsis of the problems with the, the brevitoxin hypothesis. Uh, first, there was no red tide coincident with uh, the dolphin mortality. Uh, there was a red tide off the coast of Cape Hatteras in uh, October of 87. However, the mortality, the increased mortality began in June off the New Jersey coast, and uh, no red tide was observed in, in that area. Uh, red tides normally kill fish, shellfish, and birds in high numbers. And again, uh, this was species-specific dolphin mortality, except around Cape Hatteras, where the red tide was. Uh, brevitoxin has not been previously documented to affect dolphins in spite of the fact that red tides are fairly common occurrences in the Gulf of Mexico, and the Gulf of Mexico has a large population of bottlenose dolphins. Uh, brevitoxin is a, an acute neurotoxin. Uh, when it's lethal, it uh, causes death by respiratory paralysis, so it's not known to produce the lesions that were found in the dolphins, which were mainly bacterial and fungal pneumonias, uh, disseminated fungal infections, and septicemias. And more recently, the uh, analysis that was used to detect the, pre the uh, presence of brevitoxin in the dolphin livers has been found to have a very high incidence of both false positives and false negatives, leading the National Marine Fisheries Service to conclude that it's not uh, reliable enough to be used as a uh, test at this stage. So uh, 
after this initial investigation was concluded, the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, had the material, the pathologic material, transferred to the AFIP. Dr. Yvonne Shulman and I have uh, been studying the material, and uh, we have uh, found findings uh, quite similar to what I showed you in the bottlenose dolphins from the Gulf, except that uh, the tissues were generally uh, in a poorer state of preservation, uh, making observation of the characteristic viral lesions difficult, and, uh, well, similar to those cases, there were frequently these fulminant infections, both bacterial and fungal, that tended to obscure uh, viral lesions. But in any case, we've tested uh, 79, we've tested lung and lymph node from 79 bottlenose dolphins and 42 are positive by the immunoperoxidase. So that's 53% uh, positive for morbillivirus. So we, we believe that uh, morbillivirus is very likely the, the cause of the epizootic. We have used the PCR on uh, several of these cases, on six of them actually. Uh, in uh, four of those, uh, we had good uh, histological findings, namely syncytia, inclusion bodies, and they were immunoperoxidase positive. On two of them, uh, we had good histological findings, syncytia and or inclusion bodies, but they were negative by the immunoperoxidase. They were both positive by PCR. So we expect that uh, when we've uh, used the PCR on all of the cases, the proportion is going to go up. So that was lung again with syncytia, lymph node from one of these Atlantic 87, 88 cases with a nice syncytial cell. Okay, uh, the uh, comparative studies on the marine mammal morbillivirus viruses have been very interesting. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the virus from the Baikal seals is uh, probably canine distemper virus or a strain thereof and it probably, thus, it probably originated from terrestrial carnivores in that area. The, uh, the virus from the harbor seals is more closely related to canine distemper than to other morbilliviruses, but it's uh, clearly different from canine distemper. It's a new morbillivirus. Uh, the viruses from the striped dolphins and the harbor porpoise are closely related to each other, and they're more closely related to render pest and pest de petite ruminant than to uh, the other morbilliviruses. And very uh, preliminary results from uh, the uh, molecular biology group at the AFIP indicates that the uh, bottlenose dolphin morbillivirus is very closely related to the striped dolphin morbillivirus, not surprisingly. Uh, the, uh, the interesting question, I think, in all this is why uh, five morbillivirus epizootics in about a, a seven-year period in these different species of marine mammals scattered widely uh, throughout the world uh, and uh, that, that question hasn't been answered. Uh, the one hypothesis that's been mentioned is uh, pollution causing immunosuppression pollutants such as uh, PCBs, uh, but uh, it seems unlikely to me that uh, pollution would reach a critical immunosuppressive level in uh, Lake Baikal, the Gulf Coast of the U.S., the East Coast of the U.S., the North Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, all within a seven-year period, especially when we have no <coughs> direct evidence that pollution is increasing in those areas. So I don't think that's it. Uh, we do know that uh, morbilliviruses frequently will infect closely related species, as I already mentioned. 
It may be that uh, there's been contact between uh, groups of uh, dolphins and groups of seals uh, resulting in transmission uh, from enzootically infected species to naive species. Uh, that might be occurring and in fact uh, evidence of serologic evidence of morbillivirus infection has been found in uh, some species of seals prior to the uh, harbor seal epizootic. Uh, these seals were in uh, Greenland, I believe, uh, ring seals and gray seals. So uh, no one really knows what's going on exactly, but uh, that might be part of it. Okay, uh, moving along, pox viruses. Pox viruses ca cause uh, skin disease in a number of species of cetaceans and pinnipeds. We'll start with dolphin pox. Uh, this is an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin with multiple punctate uh, ulcers on the skin of overlying the mandible caused by dolphin pox. Uh, here are examples of the uh, so-called tattoo lesion, these rings of uh, hyperpigmentation in the skin of a dolphin. Uh, histologically, if you're very lucky, you can find intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies uh, within these lesions characteristic of uh, pox virus and other species. Um, cutaneous pox virus infections have been described in uh, several pinniped species, including harbor seals, South American fur seals, northern fur seals, and gray seals. The lesions tend to be most numerous on the head and neck as seen in this uh, South American fur seal. These are generally two to three centimeter diameter nodules that uh, uh, ulcerate, heal slowly, and cause focal alopecia. Histologically, there's acanthosis, uh, ballooning degeneration, and intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies typical of uh, pox and other species. People that handled uh, gray seals that uh, had pox viral lesions developed uh, lesions on their hands and fingers similar to Milker's nodules. Okay, Khaleesi viruses. San Miguel sea lion virus is a Khaleesi virus that affects California sea lions and northern fur seals. <coughs> Infected animals develop vesicles that uh, rupture and ulcerate primarily on the flippers, lips, nose, chin, and gingiva. You can see some of these vesicles here. And uh, extensive ulceration of the skin of the flippers here. I think you can see a couple of uh, intact vesicles here and there. Here's the histologic view uh, with a vesicopustule within the stratum corneum. Uh, there's a, a single report of isolation of a Khaleesi virus from a vesicular skin lesion in a bottlenose dolphin. The authors of that report speculated that this infection was transmitted uh, from the dolphin to a California sea lion and then from the sea lion to another bottlenose dolphin, uh, suggesting a very broad host range uh, if the authors were correct. Okay, the only adenovirus uh, of note in marine mammals is sea lion hepatitis virus. This virus affects small numbers of California sea lions, but it can cause fatal disease. Gross findings include icterus, splenomegaly, 
mesenteric lymphadenopathy, and areas of discoloration of the liver. The distinctive histologic finding, which is not terribly well represented here, is uh, multifocal hepatocellular necrosis with intranuclear inclusion bodies, uh, perhaps these, uh, within hepatocytes and occasionally in Kupfer cells. Sorry, I don't have a better example of that. A type A influenza virus was reported to cause uh, severe, often fatal, pneumonia in harbor seals. Affected seals had cranioventral areas of uh, pulmonary consolidation. Interstitial emphysema was common. And histologically, there was a severe necrotizing hemorrhagic bronchopneumonia, uh, which was presumed to be caused by secondary bacteria. Um, this diagnosis was based on culture of the virus. Uh, personally, I'm skeptical of this report. The, uh, the virus was not uh, demonstrated in tissue and attempts to uh, induce the disease by administering the virus to uh, other seals failed. And the uh, descriptions of the lesions are remarkably similar to uh, more biliviral lesions. Uh, and to my knowledge, the material from these seals has not been tested for uh, more bilivirus. So uh, I'm skeptical. OK, uh, herpes viral disease has been reported in several species of marine mammals. A herpes virus caused an outbreak of uh, often fatal disease in captive harbor seal pups. Lesions were an acute diffuse interstitial pneumonia with a fibrinous exudate and interstitial emphysema. Massive hepatic necrosis with minimal inflammation was also present. Inclusion bodies were not described in that report. Uh, we have a single case in the veterinary registry at the AFIP uh, of a harbor seal pup from uh, Washington State that uh, had uh, lesions compatible with uh, a herpes virus. Uh, in any case, there was uh, multifocal uh, hepatic necrosis and hemorrhage and uh, similar acute necrosis of uh, adrenal cortex. Uh, there were some rather ill-defined inclusions, intranuclear inclusions, and uh, I thought I had an EM of that. Oh, well. Ultrastructurally, uh, there were viral particles consistent with a herpes virus. Uh, here's a, a beluga whale. Um, a herpetic dermatitis has been reported in beluga whales. Uh, the lesions appear as uh, uh, gray uh, plaque-like elevations that can be quite extensive. This one has some central scarring. And histologically, there's marked swelling of the uh, epidermal cells with prominent intranuclear inclusion bodies. And uh, ultrastructurally, there are viral particles compatible with a herpes virus. During the sea otter rehabilitation effort following the uh, Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska, an outbreak of ulcerative stomatitis affected many sea otters in, uh, more, well, in two or three of the rehabilitation centers. My memory eludes me now. But uh, the otters showed no evidence of uh, illness. They continued to eat well and uh, uh, seemed to be fine, but uh, they had uh, these oral lesions. Uh, this one, there were two types of lesions. Uh, the first is quite subtle. These uh, whitish uh, 
plaque-like areas on the gingiva and on the tongue, which uh, most people would probably overlook. Uh, but other otters had chronic ulcers frequently on the ventral surface of the tongue, and they were often bilaterally symmetrical like this. And it was kind of a, a problem because <clears throat> the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to release these animals. Uh, you all may remember that it cost a fortune to rehabilitate a sea otter, like $80,000 per animal when you figure it all up. Of course, Exxon was paying the bill, so you know. <laughs> who cared? But on the other hand, uh, couldn't very well release these otters if they had some sort of uh, disease. Uh, might be introducing a, a disease into the wild population, which you certainly wouldn't want to do. So uh, people scurried around and collected biopsies. Could you sharpen that up a little, Jeff? The, uh, the oral <coughs> ulcers were nonspecific, really. Just uh, there were areas of uh, necrosis of the epithelium, uh, mixed inflammatory cells, a bed of granulation tissue. Uh, but within the uh, oral epithelium adjacent to the ulcers, there were frequently uh, cells that were uh, undergoing degeneration and necrosis, and these frequently contained intranuclear inclusion bodies uh, suggestive of uh, a herpes virus. And uh, ultrastructurally, there uh, are uh, viral particles compatible with the herpes virus. And uh, there's also been uh, some uh, monoclonal antibody work that uh, uh, apparently confirms this is, in fact, a herpes virus. We don't have to say herpes-like. Uh, a few otters had uh, keratitis. And Again, within the corneal epithelium, there were similar intranuclear inclusion bodies, and the corneal stroma showed uh, chronic inflammation, uh, neovascularization, hemosiderosis. Okay. So I should mention that uh, uh, there was this problem with releasing the otters. Uh, people actually went out in boats, captured wild, uh, normal-looking sea otters, and looked in their mouths. I thought this was a complete waste of time. I figured, you know, it's like uh, herpetic disease and other species. You've got all these otters crowded together and stressed. They're having uh, recrudescence of latent herpes, and you're not going to see any lesions in normal animals. But I was wrong. Uh, they were able to find a number of sea otters in the wild that had these plaques. Didn't find the ulcers, but they had these kind of nondescript plaques. And if you biopsy them, there's the lesion. Okay. Just uh, cleaning up the, the viral diseases. Uh, a virus morphologically similar to a, a Rio virus was found in a palatine ulcer. Of an, a, <coughs> of an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin that died during the 87-88 mortality event. Uh, whether or not that virus is a pathogen is undetermined. And there's serologic evidence of uh, hep a infection with a hepatitis B-like virus in a captive Pacific white-sided dolphin. Move on to bacterial disease. Uh, Erysipelothrix ruseopathiae causes the uh, septicemic disease of animals known as erysipelas. It's a gram-positive bacillus. Uh, frequently causes disease in pigs, lambs, and birds. Dolphins of several species are also affected. Um, the disease in dolphins may be sporadic or it can occur as outbreaks. And it, it's believed that uh, uh, the source of the bacteria in dolphins is fish ingested fish. Uh, clinical signs that have been reported include anorexia, lethargy, coughing, flatulence, diarrhea, evidence of abdominal pain. 
Two types of skin lesions have been described. Uh, the most characteristic are these uh, square or rhomboidal skin lesions uh, similar to diamond skin disease of swine. Uh, lesions, skin lesions can be uh, more nonspecific, such as these uh, or nodules and, and ulcers. Uh, the cause of the cutaneous lesions is uh, infarction. Uh, this is uh, hypodermis of an affected dolphin, and you can see a fibrin thrombus occluding this vessel. Uh, once in a great while, you might find some of the bacteria in one of these thrombi, but often you don't. Uh, just about a year ago, we had a, a case submitted it was a, a captive bottlenose dolphin. Uh, histologically, there was multifocal uh, subpleural hemorrhage in the lung. And uh, you can see uh, bacterial emboli within the pulmonary capillaries. Uh, this is liver. And uh, there are also some bacterial emboli in here. There's also some fatty change. And here's a glomerulus again with a, a bacillary embolus. Uh, so rather uh, subtle lesions, but uh, uh, Erysipelothrix ruseo pathia was cultured. So this is a case of per acute erysipelas in a dolphin. Um, I should mention that uh, erysipelas is, of course, a an important uh, zoonotic disease. I recently met a veterinary pathologist from Scotland who cut his finger while doing an autopsy on a dolphin. And uh, to uh, make a long story short, he uh, uh, developed uh, septicemic uh, infection with erysipelas, uh, erysipelothrix. And before he had actually uh, CNS signs, so he probably had a bacterial encephalitis at one stage of the game. And uh, he was hospitalized for a long time. His finger was amputated, but uh, he's OK, generally. And I forgot one more lesion in, in this uh, dolphin with erysipelas was a, a necrotizing uh, enterocolitis, which uh, provides uh, a little bit of evidence that uh, the, the idea that uh, ingestion of contaminated fish is the source uh, is true. Leptospirosis is a significant disease of California sea lions and northern fur seals that occurs in uh, periodic <laughs> outbreaks. Leptospira pomona is the most common serotype involved. Um, affected animals are lethargic, pyrexic, anorexic, and reluctant to move. Uh, they have elevated white counts, uh, elevated BUN, creatinine. In adults, abortion and nephritis are the primary manifestations of the disease. In neonates and aborted fetuses, hemorrhage is the most prominent lesion. Uh, this uh, aborted fetus has some cutaneous hemorrhage in various places. Uh, hyphema is also common. And uh, in this case, there was rather extensive pulmonary hemorrhage. Adults have a lymphoplasmacytic uh, interstitial nephritis. And the, the Worth and Starry method at pH 4.0 will demonstrate the uh, uh, spirochetes within tubular epithelium and lumina. Dermatophilosis is a disease of high morbidity and low mortality in southern or in South American sea lions. Uh, sea lions with dermatophilosis have multifocal cutaneous crusts uh, that can be quite extensive. They can affect uh, uh, virtually the entire body. Uh, and this fixed specimen demonstrates the, uh, the crusty exudate. 
Histologically, as in other species, the, the characteristic lesion is uh, alternating bands of uh, uh, hyper eosinophilic epidermis and uh, exudate. This uh, silver stain demonstrates the, uh, the organisms uh, quite dramatically. Uh, in a gram stain, you can uh, see the railroad track-like, if you will, uh, appearance of the uh, bacilli or cocci or whatever they are. Okay, Staph aureus is a gram-positive coccus that's common in the environment and also a uh, common inhabitant of skin and upper respiratory tracts of people and animals. Infection causes a pyogenic reaction. Cutaneous infections are common. In dolphins, Staph aureus is a fairly common cause of pneumonia, septicemia, and abscessation. This is a uh, suppurative and hemorrhagic pneumonia from a bottlenose dolphin that was caused by Staph aureus. Uh, a uh, brown and Bryn gram stain of, of this lung shows the myriad uh, cocci, gram positive cocci. This is a, an opened cerebral abscess from a captive bottlenose dolphin from which uh, Staph aureus was cultured. Streptococci are also uh, gram-positive cocci. Stepping on wires. Uh, it's, uh, they survive poorly in the environment. They're essentially obligate parasites. Uh, they've been reported to cause postpartum detritus and septicemia as well as pneumonia in dolphins. Just that. Okay, Pseudomonas, another opportunistic pathogen. This is a lung from a, a pilot whale with a suppurative and hemorrhagic pneumonia. Uh, you can see that the exudate is almost exclusively neutrophilic. And in this gram stain, you can see that this was a mixed infection. There are uh, gram-positive uh, cocci here, uh, which, was that staph or strep? Staph. And you can also see gram-negative bacilli here, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Clostridium perfringens is a large gram-positive spore-forming bacillus, normally found in the soil and intestinal tracts of animals. Many strains produce potent toxins Clostridium perfringens has been reported to cause fatal infections in Atlantic bottlenose dolphins characterized by gas-filled cavitations in the dorsal musculature, liver, and kidney. The same bacterium has been cultured from areas of myositis that arose at sites of intramuscular injection. This is a, another recent case. Uh, this was a captive bottlenose dolphin that died after a, a brief illness. Generally speaking, dead dolphins sink initially, but this one was floating. And uh, upon opening the uh, abdomen, it was found that the intestines were distended with gas. You can see here that the, the wall of the intestine is uh, quite edematous, and there are some uh, numerous, uh, in some areas, confluent uh, dark foci on the mucosa. Histologically, there was uh, coagulative necrosis uh, superficially in some areas of the intestine. And in this gram stain, you can see that the 
necrotic areas are covered by a mat of uh, gram-positive bacilli, while the uh, more normal appearing areas are not. And at high magnification, you can see that these are large bacilli uh, compatible with Clostridium perfringens, which was cultured. So this is probably a case of uh, fatal clostridial enteritis in a bottlenose dolphin. Okay. A variety of other bacterial agents have been reported to cause disease in marine mammals. Uh, I'll just briefly mention a few. An outbreak of Pseudomonas pseudomallei septicemia killed 24 dolphins in a Hong Kong aquarium. Uh, here we have a hematogenous interstitial pneumonia from one of these dolphins. Necrotizing, acute necrotizing hepatitis uh, from the same animal. Again, caused by Pseudomonas pseudomallei. Uh, a few cases of mycobacterial infections have been reported in marine mammals. These are lungs of a manatee, and here we have uh, multiple granulomas. There's a histological view of one of these granulomas, uh, caseous necrosis centrally. Uh, looks like uh, peripheral fibrosis primarily, some macrophages at the periphery. Um, and uh, Mycobacterium marinum was cultured from that case. Okay, uh, a large number of fungal infections have been reported in marine mammals, and I'll just go over a few of the more interesting ones. Um, lobomycosis is a kind of a mysterious disease. It's an uncommon cutaneous infection of people and dolphins only. They're the only... Uh, animals affected. Um, the people that develop uh, lobomycosis uh, are from a few uh, areas of South and Central America. It's very localized. In dolphins, it's been found mainly in uh, animals around Florida. Uh, a couple of cases in the Suriname River. People in Suriname uh, are also occasionally affected. I've seen one case in a dolphin that's stranded in North Carolina. Uh, he may have uh, migrated up from Florida, though. These are the characteristic gross findings in affected dolphins. These white nodules, or in some cases, uh, more verrucous crusts. Some similar nodular lesions on a flipper or a fin. Uh, just a close view of these white nodules. Histologically, right at the junction of the uh, uh, epidermis and the papillary dermis, there are granulomas consisting of uh, macrophages, multinucleated giant cells. Uh, the PAS demonstrates the fungal organisms uh, nicely. And the, uh, the morphology of this organism is distinctive and allows a specific diagnosis. Uh, there are these yeast-like bodies that are about 8 to 12 microns in diameter. And as they bud, they produce these uh, tube-like connections. Uh, and occasionally, uh, a single cell will give rise to several chains of these organisms. Uh, lobomycosis does not disseminate as far as is currently known. It remains cutaneous. Uh, captive dolphins occasionally develop chronic cutaneous candidiasis. In other cases, esophagus or stomach uh, are affected as the primary site, and occasionally disseminated infections occur. Uh, this is uh, the squamous stomach of a bottlenose dolphin with uh, multiple ulcers from uh, candida. 
Um, this is a histologic section of stomach from a captive pilot whale with a focal ulcer. And you may be able to see uh, some fungal hyphae in this uh, PAS stained section. Uh, you can probably see them here at least invading a, a blood vessel deep in this ulcer. That's it. We're on the home stretch here. And uh, this is kidney from the same animal, different stain, uh, showing the uh, characteristic morphological features of uh, candida in tissue, which include the presence of uh, yeast like bodies, uh, pseudo hyphae, uh, which are yeast-like structures that uh, bud and are connected uh, at a point of indentation, and true hyphae, which do not have uh, indentations. In the material at the AFIP, aspergillosis is the most common fungal infection of cetaceans. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, uh, both captive and free living animals are affected. Um, it's almost invariably invasive and disseminated aspergillosis. Reported clinical signs in captive dolphins have been decreased activity, um, inappetence, weight loss, and dyspnea. Hematologic findings are increasing leukocytosis, neutrophilia, lymphopenia, monocytosis and an initial eosinophilia that progresses to eosinopenia. And these findings suggest uh, inflammatory disease and a corticosteroid effect. This is generally a, a fulminant lethal infection. These are lungs from a dolphin, kind of a dark slide, but you can see multifocal areas of hemorrhage uh, within the lung. Uh, the uh, infection very commonly uh, disseminates hematogenously to the brain. And uh, in this cross section of the cerebrum, you can see hemorrhagic infarcts caused by the uh, fungus. Frequently, uh, what may be the uh, initial site of infection appears to be trachea or bronchi. Uh, here in this bronchus, you can see uh, uh, almost circumferential, uh, intense inflammatory zone. And these are fungal hyphae here, uh, higher magnification, showing this mat of fungus overlying the zone of necrosis and inflammation. And uh, again, just the mat of fungal hyphae. Uh, you frequently see the fungus actually growing in the cartilage of the airways. Uh, surprised me the first time I saw it, but now I've seen it frequently. And it uh, causes a, an acute suppurative and hemorrhagic lesion. You, you don't see granulomatous inflammation in these cases. Uh, it's very acute. Okay, um, an outbreak of dermatitis in uh, captive California sea lions and gray seals was attributed to infection by fusarium species fungi. The gross lesions were these cutaneous papules, uh, nodules, and ulcers. Histologically, there was uh, granulomatous inflammation in the papillary dermis, marked acanthosis. And here you can see the, the fungal hyphae growing within the papillary dermis. This uh, outbreak, uh, which occurred at the National Zoo, was attributed to excessive chlorination and high temperature of the pool water. 
And uh, since those uh, problems were corrected, the condition hasn't been seen. Just mention uh, one more fungal infection that we found to be really quite common in cetaceans. That's zygomycosis. Uh, that term, zygomycosis, refers to infection by any one of several genera of fungi that share a common morphology in tissue. Uh, we've seen cases in bottlenose dolphins, specific white-sided dolphins, and killer whales. Um, the disease, zygomycosis, is very similar to aspergillosis in cetaceans. Uh, you can't really tell from this uh, uh, photo mic, but uh, this is trachea with uh, an acute suppurative tracheitis uh, that contained the organisms. This is brain. This was a cerebral vessel. It's necrotizing vasculitis, neutrophilic infiltrate hemorrhage. And uh, here you can see the, uh, the hyphae in the brain, and uh, this is a, a GMS counterstained with uh, hematoxylin and eosin, demonstrating the, the broad hyphae, uh, bulbous dilatations, uh, tendency to collapse, uh, right angle branching perhaps, all of which are characteristic of zygomycetes. Okay, the last uh, group of pathogens that we're going to talk about are uh, protozoa. And first, uh, Toxoplasma gondii. Um, toxo apparently can infect all homeothermic animals, and marine mammals are no exception. But the, the number of uh, reported cases is small. Uh, toxoplasmosis has been found in dolphins, California sea lions, and northern fur seals. Um, both cases in which uh, immunosuppression probably played a role and cases in which there was no evidence of uh, immunosuppression uh, have been described. This is adrenal cortex from a spinner dolphin with an acute necrotizing adrenalitis. And you can see zoites within this uh, adrenal cortical cell. This, uh, well, we've got two disease processes here. I'm sure you all can tell what they are. So there's toxo, big surprise. What's the other one? Yeah, sure, more bilivirus infection. Syncytia. Uh, this is a, a striped dolphin. And uh, uh, toxoplasmosis was found in four of, uh, I believe it was 58 striped dolphins that uh, uh, were studied during the uh, outbreak of more bilivirus disease in the Mediterranean. Uh, the uh, spinner dolphin that I just showed you had no evidence of uh, morbillivirus infection or any other uh, apparent cause of immunosuppression. Okay, this is uh, kind of a, an interesting lesion uh, that uh, we found to be quite common, really. This is uh, an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin, uh, brown and brin stain. It just happens to uh, show what I want to show better than uh, any of the other stains that I had. But uh, there's a cutaneous ulcer. And superficially, myriad gram-negative bacilli within the necrotic tissue beneath the ulcer. And in the tissue beneath that, numerous ciliated protozoa. Uh, you'll have to take my word that they're ciliated. I don't think you can see that here. And it's really difficult to, to demonstrate the cilia frequently. But uh, there's these are 
The organisms are about 40 to 80 microns in diameter. They have a, a large nucleus. And uh, in some cases, if you search diligently, you can find one that's positioned so that you can see the, the cilia along the border. Uh, I don't think anyone has identified uh, which ciliate this is. Uh, we suspect that these are secondary invaders in lesions caused by uh, other mechanisms, uh, but they're quite common in uh, dolphins that strand on the Atlantic coast and uh, Gulf coasts of the United States. Um, I expect you all feel about like this right now, so 